Um, good evening to you. And um, uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was a few weeks ago, somebody said to me, I only got taught by an ancient historian. How old is he? Which reminds me of some time ago when I was um, visiting somebody and I came across this lady, and um, because I'm a Christian, and she said, Well, she said, Oh, I'm a believer as well. I said, Oh, that's amazing. I said, um, so how long have you been a believer? Oh, about 5,000 years or so. She said, which is a very strange thing. Um, sometimes you come across. Well, this evening, I'm going to be speaking about Genesis, tracing Genesis through the ancient cultures. And um, I'll be looking at, particularly focusing on the first 11 chapters of Genesis and seeing if there's any possible evidence uh, in some of the ancient cultures. Before I do that, I just want to mention something, a couple of quotations, real quotations from teenage blunders in their GCSE exams in ancient history. And I just remembered I must switch my mobile off. <laughs> in case that goes off. There we are. Um, and real life um, quotations from some teenagers in their GCSE exams. The first one, the Greeks were a highly sculptured people and without them we wouldn't have history. The Greeks also had myths. A myth is a female moth. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it, what you sometimes get in exams? Another one, Socrates was a famous Greek teacher who went around giving people advice. They killed him. Socrates died from an overdose of wedlock. <laughs> After his death, his career suffered a dramatic decline. <laughs> I can remember, I used to be a teacher and marking some of these things. I had extraordinary uh, things sometimes. But they're amusing. Um, but there's also something about it. Um, the, a couple of students I mentioned beforehand, yes, they had some true things that were there in those uh, statements. Yes, the Greeks did have myths. No, Herodotus, as I was taught, I mean, I was taught he was the father of history. But actually, he wasn't. That was just one of those things that was thrown out uh, when I was... Um, I suppose, do my, in those days, GCE, um, um, O-level. And uh, other things as well. Socrates was a famous Greek teacher, but he did not die from an over overdose of wedlock, but of, anybody know what he's supposed to have died of? Yeah. Hemlock. That's right, form of poison. And uh, these days I found that very often we are, everything seems to be sort of taught through... Uh, Darwinian evolutionary glasses, so it doesn't, mean, doesn't matter what it is, it includes ancient history too. And because of this particular academic bias, that we actually often um, miss out some things which would be even right under our nose, which could be very exciting and unlock certain things in our understanding of history. So tonight I want you to, to take you through something about ancient history, let it speak for itself, and you as a listener uh, to make your own judgments. Um, with the advent of Darwin's Origin of Species, 1859, as I said, a lot of the things uh, were viewed through evolutionary understanding, which included the Bible, and it was a growth of liberal scholars, particularly in the 19th century going to the 20th century, and became very sceptical of the Bible. I want to just say in the outline, as we are going through tonight, we're going to be looking at the antiquity, the, the, how far we can trace Genesis back, Looking at creation, the views of creation, the first ancestors, the fall, that is um, when the first human beings, are, according to the Bible, there's something went wrong a long way back and they lost their contact with their creator. Uh, the flood that's, that was mentioned in, in Genesis. The table of nations, how after the flood the, the people spread through the ancient world and the Tower of Babel, when there was a confusion of languages. And uh, if I get time at the end, something which you'll find out what nurse that, the desire of the nations. I want to have a look, first of all, looking at the first part, Antiquity of Genesis. And um, here's this chap I was mentioning earlier about uh, evolutionary understanding and, and uh, influence on biblical thinking. And he was a man, uh, Julius uh, Wellhausen, uh, who was one of the German um, higher critics. And uh, one of the things he came up, he was, there was a bunch of them, but he was particularly well known for the theory which was called either documentary hypothesis 
or literary theory, or some people refer to it as the JEPD, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, traditionally, both Jews and Christians had accepted that Moses had written the first five books of the Bible, around about 1450 to 1400 BC. Well, Wellhausen came along, and he began to look at it in a different way through his understanding of words and literature and so forth, applying that to the first five books um, of Moses, as they've been traditionally called. So they had this J-E-D-P, which is... J, basically, was, was short for the name Jah, or Yahweh, which is one of the names of God in the Old Testament. And he reckoned um, that there are various writers that had written um, those books of, of um, the Old Testament. And the first one, he reckoned, had been written by some person about 850 BC. The second one, um, E for El, or Elohim, um, a word for God. Uh, again, he thought it was another writer who had written in about 700 BC, because he thought you couldn't have these two names being the same God, there must be different writers. And then D was short for Deuteronomy, the last book of the books of Moses, which he reckoned um, a scribe had written around about 621 BC. And the last one, Priest, who had gone over the whole lot, and it had been written, uh, about 500 putting things together, and then maybe refined and purified later on, even by somebody else's uh, long later, back as um, 200 BC. The only trouble is, when we actually look at it, um, the first thing is that there was an understanding, because evolution sort of affected the whole way that people thought, including understanding of religion, they thought that the concept of God had evolved, that in other words there had been a form of simple animism right through to magic, right through to many gods, finally to monotheism or one creator God, because that fitted in the theory of evolution. However, and I'm going to go on, uh, look at this a bit later, I'm actually going to show you the exact opposite is what we find in the archaeological and anthropological uh, record. But another thing that they thought was that Moses, there's no way back in sort of 1450 or so BC, would ever have had a concept of a, um, of a sort of complex legal system, which you mentioned, which is mentioned in his writings. Therefore, um, it couldn't have been written so early. But archaeologists after Wellhausen had actually dug up the Code of Hammurabi about 1700 BC, which actually contains quite amazing uh, legal understanding. But he wasn't the only one. There was um, also the laws of Lipit Ishtar, the king of Isin from Babylonia, uh, and which was founded in 1945. And that was dated about 1875 BC. There was also the laws of Eshunna, about 1900 BC, founded in 1947. The result of that was some of the evolutionists who had followed Verhausen's understanding actually changed their minds. And they, they started saying, well, actually Moses had copied it from an earlier source. So it went round the other way round, so it was actually far more ancient than, than Moses. They had to accept that, so they changed their mind to, uh, to fit what they wanted. And then we look at the Ebla tablets. There's a whole thousands of these were discovered in, and dated around about 2300 BC, which is amazing. What was exciting about it was in the very same tablet, written by the same scribe, you would find the two names, El and Yah. Uh, the gods, the different god names of, of the god mentioned in, in Genesis and the Bible. And obviously that completely defeated the idea that these had been two different scribes writing a long, long time apart. Uh, just a simple dig and finding some evidence silenced that. There was a man called uh, Professor Alberto Casuto, who was a well-known biblical scholar, and he actually said, I did not prove that the pillars were weak or that each one failed to give deci decisive support, but I established that they were not pillars at all, that they did not exist, that they were purely imaginary. In view of this, my final conclusion that the doc documentary hypothesis is null and void is justified. Uh, others, he went even further. Uh, Professor Archer Gleason even said that uh, this theory wouldn't even stand up, it would be thrown straight out of a court of law. So let's look something about 
the beginning of Genesis. The first thing is that, as I said, traditionally, uh, Jews and Christians have reckoned that Moses uh, had written those, uh, the books of, of, of uh, the first five books, 1450 to 1400 BC. And the question I asked was, okay, but what happened before Moses? Where did he get his information from for Genesis, for example? And was it all oral tradition just passed down by the campfire? Or were there actually written records that existed before Moses that somehow Moses may have had him, uh, access to? The fact is the Bible does not actually speak very at all about that. Jesus, the apostles and the Jews all accept Moses as the first five books. But nevertheless, um, makes you wonder, where do you actually get the, other, the earlier parts from? You think Moses, actually, he was a prince of Egypt. And it says in Acts of the Apostles, Moses was learn, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. In other words, he had access to libraries uh, and information and scholars in a position of authority. He would have been trained in reading and writing um, Egyptian hieroglyphic and demotic script and, never, and also probably translating from Babylonian and Sumerian and possibly Arcadian, which are some of the ancient languages. If we look at a king, uh, Ashurbanipal of Assyria, later, but he said this, I have read the artistic script of Sumer and the dark, obscure Arcadian, which is hard to master, and I now take pleasure in reading of the stone inscriptions before the flood. That came from a huge library from Nineveh that was discovered by archaeologists. So the fact was that people actually were far more educated and literate than we actually gave them credit to. Certainly uh, the people uh, who were very critical of the Bible in the early days didn't realise just how much stuff there was. You think Joseph was also uh, Prime Minister to Pharaoh. Again, he would have had access to all sorts of information about history and so on. And then we get to Abraham. Now Abraham, again, we tend to think about, a lot of people think Abraham is this guy in a tent with all these people, you know, with a sheep uh, trying to kick him out of the tent or something. But actually, he came from the Chaldees, um, which was an ancient city. And it was highly advanced, highly sophisticated for its time. And if, for example, we look at some of the exquisite Sumerian jewellery from uh, the Chaldees, absolutely beautiful, some of the things they had in those days, uh, artistic work. But it wasn't just that. We look at some of the schooling in those days. And um, this is a mathematical clay tablet. And you can see on the top of that, you've got all these lines and triangles and calculating distances of shorter side and longer side, hypotenuse and all that kind of thing. Don't ask me, I'm not very good at maths. But they presumably were pretty good at it, uh, going back sort of 5,000 years uh, or, or something like that. And um, they were being taught. These are things that were dug up. This is the education of the children in those days. And literacy was very high. Arch architecture in those days. Now that's obviously an artist's um, picture there. But the buildings, I'll tell you what, they lasted much longer than a lot of our buildings in the 60s and 70s, which are kind of falling down. Uh, these are amazing. In fact, I, came talk I was talking to an architect who was building some amazing houses. He he'd actually modelled it on some of the Sumerian architecture because he said it was some of the best in the world. Not only that, they had sewage systems. They had under... They had underground heating in their houses. Um, and that kind of thing. It was quite amazing. They had a postal system. Can you imagine that? I mean, imagine your letterbox, somebody clunks in one of these clay tablets, bonk, crash. But uh, they actually were doing that. And you read some of the accounts, some of the, 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 the letters on these clay tablets, and about really mundane things, about a woman's dyed her hair to please her husband. And, and could, could, could he come back from his business trip soon to sort out the son? And there's another one about a son. He's really angry. He wants to thump somebody. He's asking dad for advice. And all this kind of typical everyday life kind of things that we have to deal with, they were there on some of these clay tablets. Um, so if they were dealing with those kind of things, how much more so the really important things such as genealogies, history, 
and, and so on. Quotation here from Professor William Albright, who was a leading archaeologist. He said, concerning Abraham and the patriarchs, that's Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, he said, aside from a few diehards among older scholars, there is scarcely a single historian, biblical historian, who has not been impressed by the rapid accumulation of data supporting the substantial historicity of the patriarchal tradition. Something else is very interesting. If you read in some of the chapters of Genesis, you come across editing of place names for clarity. This is not corruption of text, but this is actually to clarify what's actually already there beforehand. For example, you come across um, the name of, of a place called Bela, which the person afterwards, to clarify it for those who will read it, because they didn't understand the names of these, these places, he says, which is Zoah. See, for example, imagine here in Edinburgh, we call this place Edinburgh. At one time it was called uh, Dunedin, or my parents live near a place called Chester, which once was called Diva. Or if you're at London, it was once called Lugdunium. So these different names that there are, which change. And so what you have here, um, I believe is you've got Moses actually writing it, but he has access to information before him. And so he has these names, Vale of Sidim, which again, is understandable for the people he's, he's there with, is called, which is the Salt Sea, or En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, Hobar, which is on the left hand of Damascus, Valley of Shava, which is the King's Dale, Bir Lahai Roy, behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered, Kiriath Arba, can you imagine living in these places, you know, where do you live? Oh, Bir Lahai Roy, <laughs> oh that's, what about, oh I come from Jirhath Arba, <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. The same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. So I believe what we're actually looking at is older records uh, which are there uh, in Genesis. Now here's an extraordinary thing. I once came across this and I thought, what? It mentions Genesis chapter 5, the book of Adam. I thought, a book of Adam? That's an amazing thing. It says in Genesis chapter 5, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. So I thought, is it possible that there were some really ancient clay tablets which people had access to? Is it, were, was there really a book of Adam? Hmm, interesting. There's actually a book of, um, it's an apocryphal work from about 250 BC. It's called the Book of As um, Asatir, and it speaks about this Book of Adam, and uh, in fact other things as well. But interesting sort of side point there. If we look um, at Josephus in a Antiquities, and he was quite a careful historian, he was a Jewish general, and he writes this, and the time of the flood, that's Noah's flood, is written down in our sacred books, those who then live, lived, having noted down with great accuracy both births and deaths of illustrious men. In other words, the Jewish people understood that there were very early writings, such as on the flood and other things like that, which had been actually recorded at some point. Barossus was um, a Chaldean priest at uh, the Temple of Bel. And he's, there are a number of accounts about the flood in Sumerian Babylonian understanding. But um, in this case, what you have is, is a reference here. It says, the deity Cronus appeared to him, that Zuth uh, Zuthros, which is another name for a Noah, in a vision and gave him notice that upon the 15th day of the month of Dicea there will be a flood by which mankind will be destroyed. He therefore enjoined him to commit to writing a history of the beginning progress and final conclusion of all things. So it's not just something we have in Jewish understanding, the Hebrews, but it's something also in other cultures that there were very early writings concerning some of these things. So a man called Professor Sir William Dawson once wrote, I've long thought that the narrative in Genesis 7 and 8, talking about on the ark, can be understood only on the supposition that it is a contemporary journal or log of an eyewitness incorporated by the author of Genesis in his work. Now this man is uh, 
not just anybody saying that, but is a chap who actually was a chairman of the Royal Society of Canada and also the chairman for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Food for thought. Well, let's move on to um, creation. And uh, creation in the ancient world. And what we find is there are essentially two views, pantheism and monotheism. Pantheism basically that everything is God. Monotheism, there's one God that created everything. And if we look at the typical pagan cyclic universe, it had a beginning, it went through, uh, and it had a, an end. The silence a bit, it starts all over again, and it continues. In fact, look at this new scientist. I saw this article from New Scientist magazine. Here's the cyclic universe, and there's a serpent, the cosmic serpent, which you often find in ancient history. Uh, Mark helped me with that one. I like, <laughs> I like to do, get that one whirring around. <laughs> but... Um, that was something that was believed then. Often people think, you know, multiverse theory, matrix, and so on. Many universes. It was around before by the Greeks. They were discussing at the time of Augustine. And people are discussing it again today. There's nothing new under the sun, as one wise person once said. If we look at Genesis, in the first few verses it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. I mentioned earlier beforehand about um, evolution thinking, really going right through, even through religion. I mentioned about people believing that the simplest, the, the simplest form of animism, magic, had evolved through to polytheism, lots of gods finally through, to monotheism, one God creating everything. Uh, people like Fraser, uh, you may have read Fraser's book or come across it, The Golden Bough, he was one of those people. Tyler and Durkheim and others, they, they spoke about this kind of thing. However, what we find in the ancient religions, as time went on, as archaeologists dug, and as anthropologists studied amongst tribes, remote tribes, they found it was actually the opposite. They found a shadowy figure in the background who was a supreme creator and that something had gone wrong and it actually devolved, it's actually gone the opposite direction, it corrupted from a purer form through to polytheism and through to simple magic and spells and so forth. In fact, if you look at today, even in our own time, what's called the New Age movement, um, we've seen that this country one time is very strongly monotheistic sort of Christian. But since the 60s, in the last sort of 40 years, there's been an amazing movement of lots and lots of people just in a short period of time of 40 years getting involved in animism, various forms of crystal healing therapy and spells and, and all that kind of thing, very popular, and it can happen quite rapidly. If we look at um, Professor Langdon, uh, he was an archaeologist from Oxford University, he said, in his understanding as a, in Sumerian history, he said, the history of the oldest religion of man is a rapid decline from monotheism to extreme polytheism and a widespread belief in evil spirits. It is, in a very true sense, the history of the fall of man. And then we have another uh, le this is a leading anthropologist. He, this is um, Professor Evans Pritchard, again from Oxford University. Whereas before the 1930s, an evolutionary concept of religion was that it developed from animism and magic to polytheism, and then finally to monotheism, Field work reversed this and anthropologists now realise that belief in one God preceded all other religious concepts. This gradually corrupted to polytheism and finally to the placating of an extensive array of nature spirits. Let's look at some of the things in the early ancient historical record. This is one clay tablet from Syria, Ebola creation account. 2300 BC, and it speaks about the god Lurgal, the great one, the creator, who speaks by the power of his word, and the whole universe comes into being. Uh, there, a very ancient sort of record. Let's have a look at another one. The Enema Elish, se the seven tablets, some people have dated them 1894, could have been the earliest originals, some have said 1595, uh, some of the ones we've got are, uh, are later. But, what you have, the first people, they, they found there were seven tablets, and immediately they thought, seven, like seven in Genesis, but it's not actually necessarily 
corresponding to that at all. And in fact, you read it, it's full of things like decapitation and, and uh, sort of gods fighting each other, and it gets pretty barbaric and, and pretty nasty at times. But nevertheless, you do find some things uh, in there with a parallel with Genesis, such as light being created before the sun and the stars, and the order of creation being the same in the bits that we do have, the mention of the deep and chaos, and a time of rest on the seventh day after man is created. Unfortunately, there are a number of lines missing, and that's a real shame because we'd be able to look at things like the order of how things came into being, living creatures and so on. But nevertheless, what you are seeing, I believe, are traces of an earlier, purer form, which is um, a sort of a proto-Genesis or proto-Hebrew understanding. Let's look at another one. An Egyptian creation account from Heliopolis, about 1800 BC. It says this, I am the creator of all things that exist, that came forth from my mouth. Heaven and earth did not exist, nor had been created the herbs of the ground, nor the creeping things. I raised them out of the primeval abyss from a state of non-being. In other words, there was some creator that brought the whole lot into existence. Um, we find the same thing. And again, in, in Hindu, Indian cultures, there's about 120 creation myths. Most of them have an eternal universe, and there are many gods. But occasionally you get glimpses of a kind of a genesis in there. And here we have one from the Upanishads. He, that's God, is the never created creator of all. He knows all. He's the pure consciousness, the creator of time, all powerful, all knowing. A Chinese creation account, originally from at least 2205 BC, and uh, they had these ritual hymns which were recorded and kept going right the way through. They had an understanding of a creator called Shangdi, which eventually became sort of, they sort of turned into sort of heaven, but originally the concept was a creator, supreme spiritual creator of everything. And there's this particular hymn, of old, in the beginning, there was a great chaos, without form and dark. You, O spiritual sovereign, first divided the grosser parts and the purer. You made heaven, you made earth, you made man. All things with their reproducing power got their being. Well, let's move on now to the first ancestors. Meet the first ancestors. And according to the Bible, you have Adam, who is uh, the first man who's created by the minerals of the ground, by the dust, and God breathes life into him. And then he puts him to a deep sleep and produces uh, his wife out of his side. And you have that in Genesis chapter 3. Well, let's have a look at a few things um, here. You have a Babylonian um, kind of Adam and Eve. Again, you have a bunch of gods. You have a, a goddess uh, involved with things. There are different gods in different places. Um, the creation of man from clay is often you find in Babylonian, Sumerian and Arcadian understanding is that there's the blood of a god mixed together with clay to form a human being. Um, but you have a first couple. And with the Sumerian um, Adam, you have this. There's actually a first man called Adamu. And there's a paradise called Dilmun. A place that was pure and clean and bright where the lion kills not, the wolf snatches not the lamb. There was no disease, pain, deceit or guile. And the god Enki, great names, the god Enki, um, says to the goddess Ninhursag, another great name, that his, his side hurts him. <laughs> and uh, she says that she's caused a goddess called Ninti, lady of the rib, to be born for him from his rib, from his side. So you have traces of this uh, sort of Genesis account amongst all this, uh, these sort of gods and so on. In the Chinese account, you have uh, a record of the book called the Wai Zing. And uh, what you have is God is made out of the clay. If you look in ancient Egypt, in the pyramid text, we read that the god Khnum, if I pronounce it properly, formed man out of clay on a potter's wheel. And the goddess Hecat breathed life into him. And so it goes on, and you trace it right through African cultures, right through and so on. There's so many, it would take too long to go through them all. But I want to look now at the so-called fall of man, or the temptation uh, in the Garden of Eden, as Genesis mentions it. Now this was a clay tablet seal. Uh, some people have said it's as many as, uh, as long, long ago as 3000 BC. 
take a bit less than that, but that's what's been put as. Very small, but this has been enlarged. But if you look and you see, um, you have a man over there, you probably can't see it very well, but he's got horns in his head, and there's a woman over here with some horns, there's a fruit tree, and there's a serpent upright behind her, and there's this fruit here that's the centre of the, uh, what's going on. Now, when first people discovered that, they said, ah, oh, they called it the temptation seal, because it was obvious to them it was the Garden of Eden story in Sumerian culture. But somebody came along and said, no, 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 I reckon it's just somebody's date business. I think, what a funny thing to have a date business. And then somebody else said, well, it couldn't be Adam and Eve because they've got clothes on. Good point. Because Adam and Eve, up to this point, were naked, according to Genesis. However, if you understand Sumerian Babylonian culture, you have to try and understand a few things. There was a sense of a cosmic serpent right through, and I'll show a few of those things a bit more. Enlightenment, or godhood, was something to be celebrated. You see, in the Bible, for human beings to become God is seen to be sinful. But in the Sumerian Babylonian culture, it was a wonderful thing to celebrate your enlightenment as becoming a god. So they were clothed, celebrating this thing. And just in the same as Genesis, you have the serpent upright. It's there, apparently giving wisdom, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle. Um, here's an interesting one, which I discovered recently. It's called the Bronze Tree of, and I don't know how to pronounce that, Zhang Zing Dui. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway, I come across this interesting thing. It's actually nearly four metres tall, which is pretty big. And it was discovered, uh, this culture of the Zhang Zingdui people, that they existed in China between 2600 and 800 BC. And what you, unfortunately, I can't really show it on this picture because it's quite small here. I wish I could show a really big one. But you have a dragon. I don't know if you can see it's got horns. And there's a dragon, which goes right underneath the whole thing. And this is supposed to be a tree. You can't see from where you are, but there are fruit. There's fruit on the tree. And there's also a hand, which is down here, which is reaching out for the fruit. Now, what do you think about that when you put those things together? Bearing in mind, this is an ancient uh, thing from China. Just hang on a minute. Let's have a look at something else. Chinese pictograms. Scholars discovered that ancient pictograms, 1000 BC, even going back a few thousand BC, and they found this story. A serpent, trees, negative, no, don't, a woman, trees, <laughs> desire or covet, two persons, Stop. Garden. Equals stumble or fall. In other words, two people were amongst these trees. They were supposed not to do something. They did it. Somehow there was a serpent involved and they fell. And in fact, uh, what you find in, in the ancient writing is that um, going right back to the Zhu dynasty, we find writings about angels Chinese angels there, who were guarding the way to, um, to heaven. Just like you find in Genesis, that there were the cherubim, the cherubim, who were guarding the way to heaven at this time of rebellion. Let's have a look at Tutankhamun now, and some of the Egyptians. There we go. Beautiful, absolutely amazing thing it is. There is Tutankhamun, uh, you have the cobra, um, and you have the whole headdress, which is a beautiful sort of cobra. But you see that, you see right the way through the Egyptian pharaohs, you see this almost obsession with the serpent. And um, it's to do with divinity, divine pharaohs that you see. Hold on to that bit as we go on. You see in the Minoan culture, uh, the Minoan goddess, over and over again you find women to do with the worship of a serpent, often with trees, in ancient cultures celebrating these things. In the pa palace at Knossos, the archaeologists discovered there were a lot of spiral symbols, 
in there, which again symbolised the cosmic serpent. Pandora, as the Greek tale, uh, according to the Greek version, uh, Pandora was told, the first woman, she was told not to open up this box, this wooden casket, and she was tempted and she opened it up and all the evils came into the world. The Garden of Hesperides one. And here you have women with a tree. The tree is not a very good tree there actually, that artwork, because they actually had gold apples, uh, gold fruit on it. And uh, the serpent was guarding this particular tree. You find it, as I mentioned, the Babylonian cosmic serpent appears right the way through a lot of the astrology and the cultures, the culture of Babylonia. You find it in Scandinavian people. And what you've got here is the ancient serpent who is nibbling away at the tree, the tree of life where all the animals and so on are, right at the root of the world, as it were. And here in Hinduism, you have the cosmic serpent. And if you look, you can see this, uh, again, it, whoops, I'm gone. I should have gone, there uh, we go. There we go. Um, that's the one. There's a whole bunch of cobra heads here. And here's the god Vishnu lying on this serpent. And here, instead of having a fruit tree, you have the lotus plant, which was seen to be very similar to that of gaining knowledge of the gods. And so you see it right through, shown in different ways in the cultures. And again in Hinduism, form of yoga, and they believe in these seven energy points going right to the body. They sit and believe it's like in the shape of a pyramid, we'll find that later on. And they believe in a thing called Kundalini, or the serpent force within, by various forms of meditation and mantras and so forth. They're seeking to raise up what they call the serpent force within, a psychic energy, so that they themselves become as God. So if you think about, put that into mind concerning the perspective of Garden of Eden, you find these things traced right through the ancient cultures. Let's move on to the flood. Now, was it a global flood? Well, over 500 cultures mention a flood. Now a lot of these, you have to bear in mind, were actually local floods. Some of them record a whole number, like in, South, uh, in, in North American Indians, there are a number recorded of local floods. Some were missionaries, Christian missionaries, who took that message of the flood and it was mixed with tribal uh, understanding. However, you do find there's, in the ancient world, a talk about a global flood. The thing about Genesis, if you think, if it's only a local flood, you have the highest mountains covered by water in a Genesis account, which would be very difficult for it to be a local flood because water finds its own level. And secondly, the rainbow was supposed to be a sign of God's promise. He'd never destroy the whole world by a flood again. So if it was only local floods, if the Gen Noah's flood was only local, then God's broken his promise hundreds and hundreds of times since because there are many, many f local floods since. And if you can't promise, uh, take him his word there, can you take him on his word any other things as well? If you look at a picture of the local flood, that would be an artist's depiction of the ark sitting on this, this uh, the ocean, the water there, right above the mountain tops, which looks a bit foolish. Another thing, the silly ark mentioned, uh, often you see this in Sunday school or something, a little cute little ark, usually with the elephants and giraffes sticking out, and a smiley white bearded Noah. But actually the ark was something really quite different in the dimensions mentioned in Genesis. And uh, if you can just, just see, um, there's a little person down there helping another person to get up. So it was a massive thing with three layers. Let's look at some flood quotations from other ancient historians. Well, here's one. The rain descended from above and the earth burst open beneath. 
and the frame of the earth was destroyed and its primitive order was broken. Its former structure went to wreck and the earth was disfigured by the flood of waters that burst upon it uh, and by the magnitude of its inundations and the multitude of showers and the eruption of the depths as the waters continually broke forth. That's Hippolytus, 200 AD. So I'm looking at another one, going back later. The earth was shaken to its foundations. The sky sank lower towards the north. The sun, moon and stars changed their motions. The earth fell to pieces and the waters in its bosom rushed upwards with a violence and over overflowed the earth. That is a Chinese historical record, about 1000 BC. Look at another one, even older. Then the gods of the abyss rose up. Nergal pulled out the dams of the nether waters. Ninurta, the warlord, threw down the dikes and the seven judges of hell, the Anunnaki, uh, raised their torches, lighting the land with their livid flame. The god of the storm turned daylight to darkness when he smashed the land like a cup. Even the gods were terrified at the flood. Sumerian account from about 2600 BC. And what you have in common with all these things, it's not just rain coming down, they emphasize most of the rain came from up, burst out from the earth's crust. And there's talk about fire with it, and earthquake, and volcanic activity, and whole geological uh, transformation that's going on. To such an extent that, for example, Scientific American sculpturing the earth from the inside out, a kind of volcanism uh, which has been recorded of, of, uh, of forming the reforming the earth at some point in the history of the earth, or subterranean oceans bursting out. Scientists have discovered there's an awful lot of water under the earth's crust. And uh, that's the kind of thing the Genesis and the ancient historians were referring to. There's also now another interesting artifact was discovered. Uh, going back um, a few thousand uh, years before Christ, and this one, was the uh, ten pre-flood kings mentioned. I won't give you the list, I probably wouldn't even be able to uh, pronounce them. But nevertheless, it's interesting because in the book of Genesis it speaks about ten patriarchs uh, before the flood. Here's Josephus. He's speaking about the actual ark. After this, that's the flood, the ark rested on the top of a certain mountain in Armenia. However, the Armenians call this place Abotarian, the place of descent. The ark being saved in that place, its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day. Now all the writers of the barbarian histories make mention of this flood and of this ark, among them whom is Barossus the Chaldean, for when he is describing the circumstances of the flood, he goes on thus, it is said there is still some part of the ship in Armenia at the mountain of the Cordaeans, and that some people carry off pieces of bitumen which they take away and use chiefly as amulets for the averting of mischiefs or uh, attacks by evil spirits, I suppose, or something. Hieronymus, the Egyptian also, who wrote the Phoenician Antiquities and, and Nicias and a great many more make mention of the same. So what he's saying is basically all the ancient historians he'd come across all knew about this great big ark on top of a mountain, but people were hacking off chunks of it and taking it all over the world as a pilgrimage site. Whether or not it exists today, I don't know. Um, time will tell whether there's anything left and maybe there are traces of it, who knows. But certainly the ancient world, as far as they were concerned, it did exist uh, as a remnant. Others, of course, the Gilgamesh flood clay tablets, mentioning about um, the flood. And they have different names for a Noah figure, but speaking of the same thing. The Chinese flood. Uh, they had pictograms. Unfortunately, that's not the one I was trying to get, but I had to find a slide, so I put that one. It's a, <laughs> uh, a tortoise on the belly of a tortoise. They used to write their inscriptions, their pictograms and everything on it. But they have an understanding of a Chinese flood with eight people on board, the same as Genesis. The Hindus, they have eight people, again, on board a great big boat, and animals, like the other ancient historians, animals were collected, put on the boat, and there were just a handful of people. Um, of course, how they repopulated the world, of course, is interesting, because they're all men. But anyway. <laughs> after the flood. So what happened after the flood? Well, the interesting thing is, the descendants of Noah, 
uh, the Bible said they, there are a certain place which would have been um, in an area of Anatolia which spreads through that part of the world, part of Iran, Armenia, uh, through into Syria uh, and through into Iraq and so on, and Turkey. And uh, what um, people have discovered is that the origin of corn comes from that same area which was then taken and spread through the world. In fact, if you look here, the Fertile Crescent, this area here, and you can see how it was taken and spread through different parts of the world. Agriculture, generally speaking, begins in the same area. And here's a quotation um, from a conference that took place in 1969, a world conference on, uh, on this. What we see today is decisive evidence that agriculture in the old world arose in a single connected region, a nuclear zone of Anatolia, Iran and Syria. Let's look at the origin of domestic, domestic animals. Again, what we find, scientists tell us, it's the same area that you find that. And you find there are thousands of bones of different animals that were found, domestic animals, whether sheep or goats or dogs and so on. Domestication are some of the, the bones that were discovered in that area. It was the origin of metallurgy, of, of metalworks, of going right back, in fact, they reckon, um, the oldest metal factory was found by a chap called Dr. Kriat Mukherjian in Medzamor, 15 miles from Ararat. And uh, it was dated about 2500 BC. Um, you also find the origin of wine, very important for those who like wine. <laughs> but this was here. The vineyards spread again. The earliest record of wine was found and uh, carbon dated from that same place. Origin of language. Again, uh, language has been sort of traced back to various, uh, a group of languages, but a number of people reckon there was a proto-language from that same area. And here's something from Scientific American. The landscape described by the proto-languages is now resolved must be somewhere in the crescent that curves around the southern shores of the Black Sea, south from the Balkan Peninsula, east across the ancient Anatolia, uh, that's today the non-European territories of Turkey, and north to the Caucasus Mountains, from Scientific America 1990. Let's move on to the Table of Nations and the spread of people and how they got dispersed from that area. And what we find is this, Noah's family tree, and you have there's Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. You have the line of Shem, Elam, Asher. Elamites threw into Persia, Asher, in the area of Assyria, and uh, Amorites and Cushites threw into the, into the Far East and threw into Africa. Mizraim into Egypt and Put into those areas of Libya. Canaan into the land of what we call Israel. Goma, uh, this is going west now. Any Welsh here? There's a few. I've got Welsh blood in me. Uh, Goma, the Gomerians, uh, became the Kimerians, and they, that's how you get Kimru, Wales. And they spread right through into Europe. Magog going up north um, with Meshek into the area of Russia and Scythia, as it was called. Madai Persians, Javan going to the Greek islands right through, and uh, so on. And I haven't got really time, unfortunately, to take a whole session just on that, but it just... Uh, it's just amazing. Um, the scientists who have actually investigated it uh, show the accuracy of it. Um, that shows you something of the dispersal of the people as they spread through um, from the area uh, going far, far afield. Here's a quotation from somebody. It's, it stands absolutely alone in ancient literature. The Table of Nations remains an astonishingly accurate document. Professor William Albright, who was a Dean of Biblical Archaeology. And another one. The so-called Table of Nations remains, according to all results of monumental explorations, an ethnographic original document of the first rank, which nothing can replace. Professor Coucher, who was a, a leading archaeologist, 
Tower of Babel. Well, they were called ziggurats in the old days, and this is one a reconstruction uh, based on what they'd have been like. Uh, and here's a sort of a somebody's sketch. There was a temple dedicated to gods, and a very part of their religious system. Here you have them spreading a further further afield, and this is Pharaoh Joseph's uh, step pyramid, 2600 BC or thereabouts. And it was a forerunner of the Egyptian pyramids, but very similar to the Sumerian ones. In fact, some people, some scholars reckon it was the Sumerians actually came over by boats, and the very first pharaohs and the very first Egyptian civilization that we know of came via Sumeria. That's what some would say. And here's an Egyptian pyramid, which of course um, developed, and instead of having seven steps, it uh, sort of developed its own cultural style. Nevertheless, it was a burial place for a divine pharaoh. The Aztecs and other parts of the world, they had their own sort of pyramids as it spread through the world. Let's look at the Tower of Babel itself. Now, this is an interesting thing that was discovered. And if you look here, you have the sun, you have... See, they often refer to the ziggurats being like mountains. And here you have this, and you have a whole load of people, and you have a very large giant of a person, which some scholars reckoned was, could have been Nimrod, which was known in the ancient accounts as well as the Bible, and who was responsible for the building of the Great Tower, which we know as the Tower of Babel. There's an interesting quotation from Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I always think about Nebuchadnezzar, he was a very eccentric man, and he was a bit full of himself, in fact... He was obviously reminded a bit of um, also Saddam Hussein, some of the things he got up to, but he's in the 6th century and there's this inscription. I have completed, he's talking about uh, one of these ziggurats, I have completed its magnificence with silver, gold and other metals, the most ancient monument of Babylon. I built and finished it. A former king built it, but he did not complete its head. Since a remote time, people abandoned it without expressing their words. That was his understanding. So he was... He came across this ancient, very, he refers to it again as being very ancient, in ruins, and he rebuilt it for his own glory. And it was at Borsippa, and it seems to be the most ancient of the ziggurats. Tower of Babel is mentioned by some of the ancient historians. There's a Babylonian one from 1450 BC. The building of this temple offended the gods. In a night they threw down what had been built, they scattered them abroad and made strange their speech. The progress they impeded. So you have the same thing about this temple, whatever it was, a ziggurat, it was offended the gods. Of course, Genesis says it was God, not the gods. And it was, the whole thing came to an end. The people were scattered and there was a confusion of languages, just like it mentions in Genesis chapter 11. Here's another one. They built a high tower where now is Babylon. And when it was already close to heaven, the gods sent winds and an entire scheme. And men, having till then been all the same speech, received now from the gods many languages. And that was a Greek historian called, I think, Abidinus, about 350 BC. And then we have the origin of language, which has been disputed. Um, and some scholars reckon there were 11 foundational languages in the world from all the other languages that have, have come out of that. But some have argued for a proto-language uh, for the 11, but it's so con difficult to actually pin it down. It's been argued back and forth over it. However, here's one person says this, the science of language thus leads us up to that highest summit from which we see into the very dawn of man's life on earth. And where the words which we have heard so often from the days of our childhood and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech assume a meaning more natural, more intelligible, more convincing than they ever had before. And that was it, Professor Max Muller, the science of language, who was one of the leading uh, exponents of language theory. I went to end with a couple of quotations um, that I'd come across, which really said for me, it's in their own words, and these are sort of experts, uh, what I felt as I spent 25 years working through ancient history and trying to dig around and find out bits and pieces uh, to see whether 
Genesis did have indeed some reliability, some historical truth, or was it just legend and myth? And this is a quotation from Professor Howard Vose, a biblical archaeologist. I once summed through the book of Genesis and mentally noted that each of the 50 chapters was either illuminated or confirmed by some archaeological discovery. The same would be true for most of the remaining chapters of the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And finally, another one. It has been my long experience that when the Bible is rightly understood and interpreted, it is never contradicted by archaeological and historical evidence when that too has been subjected to strict scrutiny. And that's Professor Donald Wiseman, who is one of the world's leading Assyriologists. And there could be others too. I could have taken from Professor Kenneth Kitchen, leading Egyptologist, and various others. Um, but I just want to leave it with that. And um, hope you've enjoyed tonight um, and the talk. I hope you found it interesting. I was struggling a bit with <laughs> clicking continually, trying to get the thing going. But for my own personal thing, I found, um, as I said, over the years, looking through the evidence, not that I know it all or found it all, or perhaps we won't necessarily find all different things, but what I have found, substantial evidence confirming the biblical record um, as it is. And uh, one of the things I did find was amazing. I mentioned the last bit there about the desire of the nations. Right back in Genesis, in chapter 3, there is mention, it talks about the serpent and you've got the Adam and Eve and they've sinned, they've gone wrong, they're trying to be gods. And it mentions there that God promises in front of them all, one day a man's going to be born of a woman. He's going to crush the head of this serpent, this, this devil figure, this evil spirit creature. Um, and this man, whoever it is, is going to crush that and the serpent's going to try and bite at his heel. Well, the interesting thing, it was like a first prophecy and the anticipation that you found in the ancient world of some divine being that would be born who would break the power of sin that held us captive and deliver us from an evil spirit and bring us back into a relationship with God. And, of course, in the Jewish understanding, you read right through, there are hundreds of prophecies going right through and it gets sharp and sharper, like looking with binoculars, focusing, until eventually it focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. But in the ancient world, I often wondered when I studied, why was it there was a huge surge of pagan people of all cultures turning to Christ? And I think one of the reasons was, when those early Christians went out, with their biblical understanding, a lot of the people recognised the things they were talking about. They recognised the Adam and Eve story. They recognised the flood. They recognised the Tower of Babel. They recognised a number of these things in their common history. But things had been sort of corrupted and confused and what came through was a clarity and many of them were anticipating a divine being who would come who was even symbolically in some of their fertility rites represented by death and resurrection connected with fertility but also the longing for this of overcoming death of some sort of divine saviour who would actually come into the world some of the cultures even it's quite extraordinary in an ancient Hindu culture had this system where they used to, this is before Buddhism came, before 600 BC. They actually would pin a goat up onto a tree, drive nails into its hand, they would put a crown of thorns, called a balusha, on its head, and they would spear it. And then it would, that one would be like a fellowship meal, and it was something to do with sin, appeasing sin, and so on. And then they would take another goat out, which would be a sign of a new life. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament, that very same thing is to be found in that system. But also, people like the Chinese anticipated something. There was a king. There was a great drought that came on the world, about 2000-something BC. And they, they had a temple system. They sacrificed to God in a temple. And the king was also the high priest. And they brought out... Um, they said, well, we can't stop this. You know, we can't get the rain. Uh, it's drought continually. The king was prepared to offer himself, and he, funny enough, he disguised himself as a sheep, put the sheep's wool on, and was prepared to, as it were, symbolically give his life on the altar. And then the rain came. And what they did was, 
and thanksgiving to God, they then anticipated one day the Lamb of Righteousness would come, that he would be the one who would bring them back to the relationship with God that their ancestors had lost contact with. And you find over and over again when missionaries have been in the world, they come across tribes where they knew about an ancestor, this great supreme God, and something went wrong, they lost contact with that God and they were worshipping the sun, moon, stars, serpents, whatever. And some of them, even like Korea, knew about the Son of God would come into the world. It's one of the reasons why Korea has been such a remarkable place in the world of very fast, rapid church growth. Because the early Christians realised that and they said, Hananim was the name of the Creator. And the promise was that his Son one day would come into the world. And they recognised it as Jesus Christ. Well, thank you very much for, for tonight and um, I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you.